All right. Welcome everybody to our webinar. We're going to wait just a minute and let everybody join us into the room. Okay, so we have a pretty action-packed agenda to get through today. So we're going to kick off as we let everybody join us this morning into this webinar, which is around tackling scope three emissions for a more sustainable supply chain. Um, really appreciate everyone taking out an hour of their morning, as I'm sure during this screen saturated time, webinars or yet another webinar isn't always at the top of everybody's list. But in terms of the expertise that we have today, who is going to be giving us you know, insights into the vast range of sustainability perspectives from a scope three. This is from Edge Environment and Supply Shift. So it will not disappoint in the hour ahead. But firstly, in the spirit of reconciliation, and on behalf of Edge Environment and Supply Shift, I'll start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. So we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander peoples today and any Indigenous people who are joining us this morning. So the format for the next hour is that we'll be hearing from each of our fantastic panellists um, on what is driving climate action, current trends in carbon reduction, some of these challenges and solutions we're facing and the scalable approaches that we have for suppliers. So we'll hear from each panellist and then at the end we have time for questions and answers which you can direct to panellists. So, as we go through each of the presentations, do have a think about what you'd like to hear more or if there's any comments or questions and pop them into the chat. We'll have time at the end to go through each of those. But without further ado, we're going to jump straight in and I'll introduce each of the panellists as we go. First up, we have the lovely Ashley Gay, who is Head of Sustainability Leadership and Communications at Edge Environment. So with over a decade's experience in sustainability strategy, reporting and engagement, Ashley is helping organisations shape, define and achieve their pathway to sustainability leadership. Ash brings her experience working with some of the world's most ambitious sustainability teams across the UK, Europe, US and Australia, including Lego, Google, BP, VF Corporation, Mondi, Mask and Goodman Fielder, Bank Australia, Transport for New South Wales, and many, many more. She specialises in helping sustainability teams join the dots, co-create solutions to drive change faster. And prior to consulting, Ash has worked for a leading buildings product supplier. She co-developed Responsible Steel, the world's first stewardship program for steel products, and guest lectured at UNSW. Ash is a published author and had a master's degree in sustainable built environments. So welcome, Ash. Thanks, Nicole, and hi, everyone. And thank you so much for having me as part of today's um, really exciting conversation. Let's dive right in. Next slide, please, Nick. We wanted to start today's conversation by really taking a moment to pause and reflect on what is a really truly profound moment in sustainability and just the interest that appears to be accelerating almost weekly. Um, I've worked in sustainability for a long time and getting to this point of, of opportunity and, and demand from 
all sorts of stakeholders for sustainable solutions is, um, is really a dream come true for many of us who've spent um, a number of years working, um, working in the sector. So let's just talk about that for a moment. So shown here on the slide um, is uh, the, the trends for searches for ESG on Google. And if you haven't used Google Trends before, I suggest taking a look. It's actually a really interesting indicator. And what we can see here is that, you know, um, interest in ESG is, is growing. And actually, you know, five years ago or four years ago, it was a quarter of what the interest is here today. And, and that's no surprise. We're seeing, you know, mainstream coverage of, um, of sustainability commitments, um, challenges, um, and, and kind of everything in between um, on kind of the mainstream media now. And so I think, you know, this is just one really small data point of a much larger trend that's really, really, really exciting for, for those of us who work in sustainability. You know, if we think about some of the things that have just kind of happened in the last couple of years, we've seen the reallocation of capital to lower carbon risk um, solutions actually accelerate during um, during COVID, which is a very different story to what happened to sustainability during the GFC. In 2020, we saw a 96% increase in investment in sustainable assets compared to just the year before. That is, again, profound. And we've also seen ESG actually play a central role um, in the recent reporting season here that we've had in, in Australia. Um, you know, it, it's gone from being kind of a question at the end of, of results to playing that really central role role in, um, in re results presentations, um, reporting, and also engagement that occurs um, on, o over the course of the financial year. So we're at this really exciting tipping point uh, when it comes to interest in sustainability. Next slide, please, Nick. And we know that this isn't just coming from investors. Investors play a really key role in that. Um, and, you know, we hear in... Um, Larry Fink's letter to CEOs um, annually, that how, how this is really changing and accelerating. So in his recent letter, he said, we're asking companies to disclose a plan for how their business model will, will, will be compatible with a net zero economy. And I think that's actually aligned to the two degree scenario, not just the 1.5 degree scenario. We're asking you to disclose how this plan is incorporated into your long-term strategy and, re and reviewed by your board of directors. Um, so I think that's a really, really, big shift to what we've seen um, over, over recent years. You know, this is also reiterated by um, the findings of the latest IPCC report, uh, the UN issuing the red alert for society, which is truly alarming. Um, and I guess what also is really encouraging is that here in Australia, we've seen mainstream um, voter interest in, in climate change, unlike ever before. Um, and actually COVID did not only slow that sorry, not only did COVID um, reiterate that, but we've actually seen um, climate change stay at the top of concern for, uh, for Australians to, despite um, the challenges that we faced in the last uh, year and a half. So there's lots of change going on. There's lots of um, perspective and demand coming from lots of different stakeholders. And now it's about how do we actually prioritise and start to navigate that. Next slide, please. I think one of the really, really great ways to kind of think about the challenge at hand is, is through the lens of an opportunity. And we know that climate risk is investment risk, it's business risk, but we also know that the climate transition presents a once in a lifetime historic investment opportunity, and that's coming from, um, from, from BlackRock. But we also know that that's, that's true across the board as well. Um, we've actually done some research recently on what does it mean to be a leader in sustainability and, and what does that look like for organisations? And we found that those organisations that are those established leaders um, around the world and have really strong reputations for good reasons in, in that space um, uh, are really seeing the, the, the value of that come through. So, you know, from, it, from the investor perspective, sure, but we're also seeing customers not just buying on price, that's also, you know, it's a, it's a key consideration, but Sustainability is a different type of conversation that you can have with customers and, and your various stakeholders. We're seeing employees more engaged, productive and healthy when they're working for organisations that are truly committed to sustainability. Um, and we're also seeing sustainability action as a key pillar of um, building and retaining trust with consumers and communities. So I think we're all here because we all agree that there's huge opportunity. There's a lot going on. It's a really exciting time to be doing what we're doing. But the question is how? 
how can we do this faster? How can we do it more efficiently? How can we achieve some of these amazing um, uh, kind of objectives that we're sort of collectively setting ourselves? Um, and I'm delighted to, to um, be handing over now to the other panelists to explore that question. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Ash. And absolutely, I love the reframing of risk and supply chain risk into opportunity. Absolutely, the opportunity is immense. And I know that Edge, we're seeing that just come through the door with organisations really starting to see that opportunity that's within the supply chain and beyond just their operational impact. So I have the pleasure now to pass on to Maisie Ald. So Maisie is a principal environmental economist and is head of the carbon and climate resilience team at EDGE. Maisie has over 10 years of international experience in environmental economics, carbon and climate change resilience. She leads EDGE's work in the carbon space, assisting clients in carbon footprint assessments, mitigation modelling and science-based target development. Her key clients are including Fraser Property, Stockland, Charter Hall, Taylor's Wine, the iconic Global Fashion Group, Telstra, Keep Park Cup, Transport for New South Wales, Bingo Industries and the Australian Timber Industry, to name a few. So she provides specialist technical input into economic modelling and decision-making support, resulting in clear action plans for organisations across a range of projects and sectors. So welcome, Maisie. Thanks, Nicole. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, so what I want to talk about is what the current trends are in both carbon reduction space as well as target setting. So there's a couple of considerations when not only looking at what you maybe as an organization are doing, but also what your suppliers, both upstream and downstream, might be doing in terms of those commitments and, and what they mean. So in the first instance, it's about understanding the boundary of what those targets might be. So we have scope one emissions, which are your direct emissions. So things like fugitive emissions associated with leaked refrigerants, uh, fuel use and scope two emissions, which is around purchase electricity. So initially we really saw a lot of companies setting targets around just their scope one and two emissions because that's really where they had that direct control. Um, but more and more we are seeing companies take on that scope three piece, which is the supply chain. So it's not only just about where as a company you may have that control, but also where you can then influence and create reductions across the supply chain and the products that you are using. And then the other consideration is level of ambition. So you will have seen there's a lot of different terms that are put out into the market in terms of how companies are making these commitments. So one of which is a science-based target. So that's effectively a target that is aligned to the climate science. And what we're seeing from the climate science is that we want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So when a company is making a claim to a science-based target, it's aligning to that 1.5 degree trajectory. So what that really means is that we have a net zero ambition at 2050, and we need to see the majority of reductions happening between now and 2030. We also have the term carbon neutral. So that's really getting to um, a, a, a zero perspective, but it uses the use of offsets. Um, and so you may see some reductions across the company's emissions, but largely that, that um, terminology is around achieving zero through offsets. And then we have net zero, which has a much more focus on making those reductions in emissions in the first place and only offsetting the residual emissions that really can't be reduced. So those are some of the terms that you'll be seeing that you may have already heard. Um, and the next consideration is the time frame with which we're seeing these targets. So we have a number of companies who have potentially set up strategies in the past, and they're coming up to an end date of 2025. So they're needing to relook at what, what the next step is. And then we also have companies who are potentially taking that first step, and they're really looking at both short-term and long-term targets. So that might be a 2030 target, which is a very common one we're seeing, as well as 2050 for the long-term instance. And that actually aligns quite well with what we're seeing from the climate science. So as I was saying, that greatest amount of decarbonization between now and 2030 with a goal towards zero by 2050. 
The next consideration is third-party verification. So third-party verification is very useful if you are an organization and you're looking at engaging with suppliers that have made commitments and reductions. It's an easy badge to understand um, and basically give that tick from your perspective. So in the first instance, one of which you might see is the Science-Based Targets Initiative. That's really um, very self-explanatory in that it's aligning back to that climate science that I was referring to earlier. And it's ensuring that companies have aligned to that trajectory and are making carbon reductions without the use of offsets to achieve those targets. And then we have climate active certification. So that's the federal government's carbon neutral certification. Um, and basically it, it does differ from science-based targets in that the um, carbon neutral certification can be achieved through the use of offsets. So those are two very different considerations um, when looking at potential suppliers that you may want to be working with, as well as when considering your own levels of ambition. And so once you've set a target, what do the next steps look like and, and what are the trends that we see there? So in terms of best practice, it's really important that those targets in the first instance are meaningful. So as I was talking about before, is it based on the climate science? Is there reasoning to the target that you are setting or that your supplier has set other than just basically picking a number in the air? Um, and it's really important from, from your own perspective as an organization that that target is including the supply chain. And this would apply as well if you're looking at suppliers. So are they actually taking on the whole scope of that emissions boundary? Or are they just focusing on their direct operations? And then really best practice is alignment to the carbon management hierarchy, which is what I have up here on the right. So in the first instance is about avoiding emissions, reducing emissions. So reducing things like energy efficiency initiatives, and then replacing, so potentially switching from grid electricity to renewables. And in the very off, uh, in the very last instance, it's about offsetting. So some considerations there are that when you're looking into your supply chains, how are they using this carbon management hierarchy? Are they focusing on offsets or are they making some meaningful reductions? It's also about the tailwind effects. So there's going to be things that are happening um, in your supply chains and within your own direct emissions as well that you basically may not have control over. And th this might be positive in terms of reductions as well. So for example, if we look at energy source from the grid, the grid is decarbonizing. And so you're effectively getting that benefit in terms of emission reductions. <coughs> If, for example, you are sourcing very high energy intensive products that are energy intensive in terms of grid energy, those as well are going to have an inherent reduction in their carbon due to that decarbonization of the grid. And then the last bit is about defining the business case. So when we look at reductions in scope one and two emissions, it's quite easy to find ways that are cost effective. And it gets a bit harder as we jump into that supply chain piece. And that's really where um, a company's leverage can come into play. And for those companies who might be smaller, potentially an option is to work together as a sector to really find where you can get that leverage across your supply chain and make some cost effective solutions happen. So that's it for me in terms of sort of what the overview of trends are that we're seeing in the market. And I'll pass back to you, Nicole. Thanks, Maisie. I love the simplified intro into carbon and also the carbon hierarchy. Um, and I think that the, the tailwind effects are always motivating to companies to hear that actually there's probably carbon reduction already have taken place in the supply chain and that they um, can account for that. So speaking of supply chain, I'm going to hand now to Tanya Harris. Tanya is a principal consultant and sustainable procurement expert at Edge Environment. She's got almost 20 years procurement experience in private, public and international development sectors. She was a contributor during the development and expert practitioner of sustainable procurement guidance ISO 2400. She's also an industry roundtable representative during the Australian Federal Government consultation to develop the Modern Slavery Act. And she is a Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply representative on the Australian Circular Economy Hub in the Procurement Working Group. She's also a United Nations One Planet Network Sustainable Procurement Expert Advisor. We're thrilled to have her as part of the panel today. So over to you, Tanya. Thanks so much, Nicole, and um, uh, lovely to be here. Um, 
As always, I'm here representing the procurement profession. And when it comes to scope three emissions, um, it's really interesting to understand how we can harness the power of procurement. But uh, starting with, um, you know, there's, there's some key challenges and barriers around what we're seeing with um, uh, leading organisations trying to manage scope three. So what are they? Um, starting with data. There's lots and lots of data to collect and that can be quite daunting. Um, it's quite challenging to be able to uh, collect and capture reliable data in a systematic and auditable way. And it's coming from numerous suppliers in numerous locations. So how do you compare apples and oranges? Um, and also how far down the value chain do you go? From a management perspective, there's um, quite a lot of uh, lack of know-how around how you actually do the management piece. Um, there's uncertainty around what you actually measure. Um, and from resourcing, I mean, procurement's always pretty lean. So, you know, how do we have a lack of, we've got constraints around lack of resources um, from a time perspective, uh, also knowledge and confidence around how you attack um, quite a bodacious uh, concept. And there's financial constraints. So from control and influence, um, as an organisation and you as the procurer, um, often the emissions are sitting outside of the organization's control, so in your supply chain. Um, uh, if you don't have an enormous amount of spend, it actually reduces the amount of influence you have to be able to extract that information. And of course, there can be supply resistance um, or not a great deal of cooperation from the supply chain. But while it's complex, it is 100% aligned with existing supply chain focus areas like understanding your human rights risks in your supply chain. Because as always, when it comes to procurement and suppliers, the key priority is transparency, transparency, transparency. And that's how we get credible data. But how do we actually get to that robust and credible data um, approach um, without needing to always use Excel spreadsheets is, well, there's some fantastic initiatives that already exist. So things like the CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project Supply Chain Program. So if suppliers are already pr providing that data to the CDP or another uh, initiative much like that, then buying organisations, multiple buying organisations are able to access that information from suppliers, therefore reducing the burden on suppliers and increasing cooperation. Um, there's also fantastic, you know, automation and the digital revolution. So technology platforms, much like Supply Shift, um, can create efficiencies uh, to be able to do the data collection for you. It provides an auditable platform and it can facilitate the exchange and um, benchmarking of exactly what um, good practice looks like between suppliers. Um, and of course, if we're looking at other solutions, when it comes to taking a tailored and targeted approach, it can create the highest impact and allows effective use of time and resources. So from a procurement perspective, leveraging our existing um, methodologies by creating a category specific solution. So identify the emissions that are hotspots in that particular category. And that can inform your purchasing decisions. Um, by including carbon specific data at the organization and product level during the competitive process, you can then evaluate based on that information. And another key opportunity is, does the company already have published science-based targets or scope three emission targets? Because that way you're able to access, you know that they already have a level of maturity and you're able to access that information. And last but not least is my favourite. Um, it's nice to end on a positive note. So collaborate, cooperate and communicate. Supplier engagement is essential and is often, um, whilst a little can be a little challenging, the nicest area. So by communicating your organisational targets, you can actually, uh, suppliers then understand what it is that they're trying to achieve. It's very hard to be able to um, uh, end up with that outcome if they don't actually understand what your organization's uh, targets are. So effective communication to begin with. Setting supplier engagement targets, um, which can commit the, the your, your organization's suppliers to science-based emission reduction targets. Um, you can do that at the start of the process through supplier code of conduct and asking for your suppliers to be able to commit to that. And through effective supplier engagement programs, 
um, using your tailored approach to the suppliers which uh, represent the highest emissions, you can then uh, uh, target your effort and your supplier engagement approach. So also training guidelines, um, both for your internal staff as well as for suppliers. What type of data are you looking to connect, uh, collect and what are the organisational targets that you're trying to achieve? Understanding how both your internal resources and your suppliers play a part in achieving that helps everyone get to the end outcome. So showcasing best examples in the supply chain, sharing your knowledge. So what are you learning? Um, highlighting the positive outcomes and, and celebrating your successes together. Um, monitoring your commitments is also an excellent way to uh, for, through your supplier engagement program. If you're already putting in action plans um, and being able to monitor and measure throughout the life of the engagement, um, easily integrating carbon emissions into that tracking and monitoring allows you to have regular and credible data where you can monitor progress and performance and have those conversations around what you'd like to achieve next together. Um, again, knowledge sharing in the spirit of partnership. So being able to provide mentoring and guidance to suppliers, particularly if they're a little bit smaller and not quite sure where to start and you're already on your journey, will help everyone in the, the race to the top. And lastly, feedback. Feedback is an absolute gift. So it, it gives suppliers an effective benchmark on where their current performance is, and they know where to focus their efforts for improvement moving forward. So, yep, effective supply chain management does rely on transparent and credible data. Scope three is no different, but it is complex. However, you can harness the power of procurement by using existing procurement processes and integrating carbon and scope three emissions as a part of those from the start of the procurement life cycle through to the end of life and supplier engagement. Thanks very much. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Tanya. Always happy to hear anything around procurement and the solutions that brings. There's some amazing solutions on that page, which I think everyone um, can learn from, especially around that monitoring of data and monitoring throughout um, the engagement with the supplier, which I think is sometimes easier said than done, but um, it's also something that our next panellist might be able to speak to. So before we jump into Jamie, though, I'll remind everyone that um, after this last presentation, we will be taking questions. So start to send through your questions in the chat function, um, and then we can have a good discussion at the end of these presentations. But on the topic of collaboration, Edge is collaborating with Supply Shift. And today we have Jamie, who is CEO of Supply Shift. Jamie received his doctorate in environmental studies from UC Santa Cruz with a focus on environmental economics and resource management. Jamie has extensive consulting and academic experience in sustainability, climate action strategy, responsible supply chains, and is a frequent speaker in academic and corporate venues. Before co-founding Supply Shift, Jamie co-founded EcoShift Consulting and taught environmental economics and sustainable design at UC Santa Cruz. He conducted nationwide research at the Urban Institute and was a Peace Corps volunteer in Panama. Jamie is, driving, is the driving force behind connecting supply shift with its customers and partners and ensuring successful outcomes and continuous improvement in supply chain operations. Big welcome to you, Jamie. Over to you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, great to be here today. Thanks for uh, asking me to join this webinar. I really appreciate it. Um, thought I would start by kind of referencing some of the things that Tanya mentioned as challenges to uh, procurements engaging the supply chain. And that's really kind of what Supply Shift is, is built to solve. So it's a really nice segue. Um, maybe you can go to the next slide. And I see that the video, I think the video is still on you. I'm happy to not be on the video, but if you want the video to be on me, I think it maybe needs to switch. But anyway, um, so when we look at those challenges that, that, that Tanya mentioned around uh, data, engagement, efficiency, um, supplier willingness, um, we've built a platform that really makes uh, 
supply chain sustainability is scalable. And what we mean by that is companies using the same tools uh, and metrics to measure things so that clearly suppliers are supplying more than one organization at a time. Um, so if they're asked different things in different ways, they get very frustrated. When that happens two or three times, when it happens 10 or 20 times, they just stop responding, right? So we need to uh, make it easier rather than harder for them to respond by using common tools. Um, companies need to be able to trend things, right? You need to be able to track things over time, re repeat processes, and so they become more and more efficient. We see response rates and um, supplier willingness and scores improving over time, right? Year one is the hardest year, year two is easier, year three is easier because you have a, a repeatable process. Um, suppliers get feedback. That's a really critical part of scaling to make suppliers um, interested and, and, and willing to understand uh, where they're falling short, where they're falling behind their peers. Uh, that peer pressure uh, part is built into the platform to, to, to really uh, make that something that gives su suppliers some instant feedback. Um, being able to use the data across different business functions, we often see that sustainability and, and, and um, procurement are, are pretty siloed across the business. So having dashboards and a platform where there's different information for different users within the company who can then use it to make great decisions uh, is really important to, to scaling instead of information living in, in, in PDFs and Excel sheets and, and Dropbox folders. Um, being able to grow the initiative, add new suppliers, change suppliers, not, not having to have your whole thing fall apart, and then being able to replicate for different issues. Supply shift covers all kinds of issues in supply chain sustainability, greenhouse gases being a core one, but plastics, uh, labor, deforestation, uh, you name it, someone is measuring it on, the, on supply shift. Um, next slide, please. So at, at a high level, what is supply shift? It, it's a multi-tier, multi-tenant network um, for supply chain sustainability. Um, it allows companies to request information, uh, either using any of our standard assessments or, any of, or a custom assessment of their tier one suppliers. About half of our customers are good with tier one. They're not looking to engage beyond tier one. And many companies, especially product companies, companies with um, goals around certain materials, um, do want to map and assess beyond tier one. So we allow that in the platform as well. Um, the multi-tenant nature of the platform allows companies to resubmit data to different customers. Um, and that uh, reduces survey fatigue, lets uh, suppliers reuse data so buyers get data faster. Um, and actually leads to actionable insights, right? That, that benchmarking, uh, we've got some great um, standard assessments within the network that allow instant benchmarking across every supplier who has responded to uh, any of the, the retailers, for example, who are using the thesis index across supply shift. Each supplier gets an instant benchmark of their greenhouse gas KPI compared to the other uh, hundreds of suppliers who responded to that similar KPI. Um, on to the next slide, thanks. Um, so for greenhouse gas specifically, how do we help companies? Um, I think as one of the speakers was mentioning before, the specific data you need for your industry sector often is different. Um, and depending how, how deep you wanna go and how you frame your particular targets, um, there are different methodology, methodologies we use to help uh, companies assess what's in their supply chain. This always takes a little bit of time to, to get in the details, but suffice to say that you might want data that's at a company level. That's the first box on the left reporting targets, um, kind of uh, call it a, a simpler version of, of what CDP does, but really focusing on, on what's actionable for you to engage your suppliers. Um, facility level is great for, for, for manufacturing companies to help them calculate um, their facility level intensity. Um, product level information is something that everyone wants, but what we find is that it's very hard for suppliers to actually report greenhouse gas emissions at a product level. It just, it's very hard to measure and most of them haven't done it. Um, and finally, for finished goods in, in the retail sector, specifically the sustainability consortium is a great tool there. Um, on to the next slide. Um, so not just uh, data, right? But how do we make data into action? So the first layer of that is being able to digest the data within the platform. So there's great tools to slice and dice, pick groups of suppliers, uh, look individual suppliers by groups, quantitative, qualitative data, trending over time, uh, you pick what graph you want to make, how you want to do it with your data, more data comes in and, and your dashboard uh, updates over time. Uh, the second layer of that is, is actions and findings, right? We found the supplier isn't reporting correctly, hasn't made any reductions. You can set an action, track their progress, really create an, an interactive process. Um, and the third piece of that is, is publishing benchmarks back to suppliers. to let each supplier know that within their peer group, they're in last place. They're the only ones who haven't set a target. Their emissions are the highest. 
we find that that kind of peer pressure really helps motivate change. Um, and the last piece, um, onto the last slide there, is that we really believe that um, this isn't just about data and this can't be solved by a software platform. So software has its role, data has its role. That's why we partner with Edge Environment. That's why uh, we partner with all kinds of organizations to make sure that this is a fully enabled program. It's not just about collecting data. It's about how do you build capacity? How do you design reduction activities, implement those right reduction activities? So next time you collect supplier data, you actually see an improvement. Um, so I will uh, now turn it back to Nicole and thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. There's so much within those handful of slides that you've shared with us. Um, I think just the ability to scale supply chain engagement is what's super exciting here. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have plenty of questions for you on what else this platform can do. But uh, we do have some questions coming through in the Q&A. And do encourage you to add them in there. No silly questions. Go for it. Let's um, make these panel members work. But I might start off with one question if we come back to Ash and Maisie, which is really around um, what you think leadership in scope three emissions reduction really looks like. So describe what you're seeing with your clients and in the market currently. What, what does leadership in scope three emissions look like, Ash? Yeah, thanks, Nicole. It's a really good question um, and one that we're, that we're getting asked more and more. I, I think for me, there's two fundamental elements. Uh, the first is evidence. So, you know, all of the kind of really important pieces that the team have talked through today. So, you know, those robust science-driven uh, targets and commitments, clear governance structure and ownership at an executive and board level, resources um, to actually kind of action and, and allocate and, um, and, and deliver on those, those commitments through to really clear and transparent uh, reporting, which I could talk all day about, but I won't. Um, you know, they're those kind of really important uh, foundational elements when it comes to being a leader in, in the climate space and in particular scope three. The other aspect that's really, really important, and I think in sustainability, we're not always great at doing this and recognising the importance of it, but it, it's clearly a really big theme that's come through in today's session, is, is that engagement, it's that, it's that inspiration, it's that collaboration. And so with that strong foundation of evidence in place, it's how are we then acting upon that. So it's having a, a publicly available and really clear position and plan around, around carbon. It's ensuring that people feel equipped to go and have these conversations because they are new conversations for people. Um, and it can be, you know, sustainability and, and climate can be an intimidating space for people who don't consider themselves experts. And we need to break through that. We need to ensure that people feel empowered to go and have those conversations and that that isn't always, you know, requiring the sustainability manager. So I think you know, that, that engagement, collaboration, telling that story, um, both of those aspects are really, really important and, and critical to being a leader in the space. Um, Maisie, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, so I guess just expanding on the engagement side of it, um, a lot of the leaders that we really see in this space are ones that are doing that engagement through their supplier and creating, or sorry, through their supply chains and creating this basically flow of change. Um, so effectively by requesting that your suppliers are coming along this journey with you, it's not only about educating them about what that means so that they have an understanding, but then also they then are motivated to make those commitments. And that's where we then see whole sectors or whole supply chains really making that change. And that's a really great thing to see. Um, and then the other side of it, um, you know, Ash, you touched on is that transparency aspect, which when you are either working with your suppliers or if you're just looking at what's happening within a sector, being able to understand what people are doing and actually really digging into what their commitments mean um, is a really vital piece of information. As I talked about before, there's a lot of terminology that flies around and ensuring that there's true meaning that sits behind that and that you're communicating what that means in terms of what you have committed to um, is really important. 
Thank you, Maisie. Communication and engagement is such a key part of this whole um, concept of scope three engagement. So you know, getting your head around those technical aspects is one thing, but then being able to communicate them meaningfully to supply chain, I think that's definitely where we're seeing um, the leaders come forward. On that, so a question to Jamie, just around, if we think of the leaders driving this internally, often we're seeing that that's the procurement and the sustainability teams. So what can those procurement or sustainability managers ask of suppliers to help improve emissions data capture? So what can they ask to, of suppliers to be able them to help demonstrate their emissions reduction? Maybe if we start with Jamie. Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, the simplest method of engagement we've designed on our platform is, is a no-cost greenhouse gas starter assessment. Ten simple questions to say, have they measured? Are they reporting? Do they set a target? Do they plan to? Quickly get a sense of like whether they're awake or not on, on these topics. Um, the facility calculator helps them calculate their emissions. If they don't know what their emissions are, you know, do you use diesel? How much what units calculates it for them? So that, that, that that's going to help them. Um, getting suppliers to reduce their emissions is actually quite challenging, right? So reporting is one part, right? But we really want to focus on um, reductions. So um, throughout the platform, that, that anonymized benchmarking, helping a supplier see that rather the only ones haven't made a reduction this year. Um, we know that buyers have a hard time putting really hard carrots or sticks on their suppliers, but that's, um, that's one way to help motivate is, is through peer pressure, right? Um, we're really excited about um, a new partnership that we have um, that's in, in concept phase right now with HSBC to provide financial incentives for uh, sustainability improvement um, through, through a preferred loan program based on uh, sustainability performance improvement. So um, it's, we're really excited about that because there are very few financial incentives for suppliers to in, uh, improve their sustainability performance. So that's um, another, another uh, method out there. And Tanya, did you have anything add, anything to add to that from that procurement perspective in terms of what you can ask suppliers? What are some of the things you can request? Absolutely. Um, I'm just, my mind's a little exploded around the concept of financial incentives. That's, um, that's a really interesting and innovative approach, which I'm pretty sure will uh, <laughs> uh, see the market move. Um, so from a procurement perspective, um, Jamie touched on organisational emissions, but we're, we're often going to be looking at both the organisation and the product itself as well. So um, I, I might focus more on the product side. So uh, asking for where does the, where's the country of origin or the uh, source of origin of the product itself, because transport emissions can easily be reduced if you know where you're buying it from and buying it from a closer source than um, the origin. Um, so having a conversation with suppliers um, to be able to understand what they, what they get, first of all, um, do they have uh, products that carry certifications, like things like um, environmental product declarations, um, there's, uh, you know, things like um, uh, life cycle analysis, which um, could be done by the supplier itself. So getting that and accessing that information. Um, are they reporting in different other places? So things like the ENGAS, um, the National Greenhouse Reduction Scheme, um, is a great place to be able to access information. Um, there's also Climate Active. Um, so actually asking the questions as a part of that procurement process. Um, uh, there's, there's, it, and of course, it is, again, around a tailored approach. So depending on what the product is, is to what the questions are. But um, uh, yeah, definitely procurement can play an amazing role in being able to collect that data up front. It's just taking the time to sit down with your technical teams as well and being able to understand what are the right questions to ask in the process. Awesome, thank you. Really a rich answer there. And I hope um, we've got some questions coming through in the q and I'm hoping that Shannon Doherty, who's asked a question around um, what questions you can ask suppliers who may not be versed in those concepts. Hopefully that gives you some of the, the ideas around those different aspects of practices. So at an organisational level, asking what they're doing in carbon versus the product or service um, and what they're doing around carbon reduction in the product and service that they're offering to your business. 
that hasn't answered your question, please pop it into the chat again. Um, but we'll keep going through now as they start to come, come in. So we also have someone who's working for the health department agency in sustainability procurement. And they have a target of carbon neutral and general waste neutral by 2030. So congrats there. But they're finding themselves struggling to set a baseline to approach general waste neutral in hospital and allied health settings. So their question is, is it the right thing to do to go through purchasing history to determine the current volume of waste and also determine what the good alternatives to certain products would be when it comes to satisfying sustainability strategy and financial efficiency? So I might hand that one, one because it's in health and also because I think this is getting into that category level analysis. I might hand that one to Tanya. <laughs> uh, your past always catches up with you, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> um, so health, uh, health um, is a major opportunity. We know that uh, health, if it was a, um, a country, is the fifth largest emitter in the world. Uh, as a sector and um, so uh, focusing on a su sustainable uh, supply chain as well as reduction in emissions is uh, an amazing initiative. So thank you so much for that question. Um, absolutely uh, looking at your purchasing history, you could also uh, uh, engage a, a specialist to be able to do a deep dive waste audit, um, which uh, looking at your purchasing history and actually um, having a look at what is in your bins um, allows you to create efficiencies and then a, a strategy which procurement can leverage as well as um, the behaviour within um, the operations. Both of those factors can contribute to re uh, reducing your waste. Um, and when it comes to certain products, um, so there is absolutely... Um, a lot of focus on sustainable health products. Um, right now, um, and in fact, I believe it should be published very soon at the United Nations level, there is a sustainable health product um, uh, list that is being created um, so that you'll be able to access that information at that global level around um, what the components are within those products to be able to then inform your purchasing decisions. Um, but at the same time, without needing to wait for somebody else's database, actually asking those questions now. So um, uh, are there uh, you know, alternatives? Looking at um, piloting those, because often yeah, the medical profession, particularly if they're wearing things, um, for a really long time, um, some of the chemicals can have responses, so um, testing new products, but also not going with single use where possible. Um, that probably my key suggestions. Thank you. Plenty of suggestions in there, but I think absolutely you know, spin data and looking at us purchasing history is a really powerful tool and something that we'd also um, advise to have a look at and really being able to tailor those responses around climate and carbon reduction. So going through the questions now, we have one from Jared Ingersoll and he's asking, would we recommend life cycle assessment of materials form a part of your scope three assessments? There's complexity to both. So would you recommend separating these pieces of work? So recommending life cycle assessment of materials as a part of the scope three assessment. I might hand that one over to Maisie to answer from the carbon analysis work. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and thanks for your question, Jared. So basically, um, I think the life cycle assessment comes into play when you have a number of key materials that you're using. So really, if your organization is selling on a product, so you have these, you know, say five key inputs um, or something along those lines versus say hundreds of key inputs, then you might want to focus on those, that smaller number where it's making up a majority of the goods that you're purchasing. Um, and it would make sense to do a life cycle assessment approach in that instance. That's going to give you the granularity <clears throat> that you can then take on to look at what are the next steps? How can you really reduce? Because you have such a good level of detail in terms of what's happening there within each of those products. Um, but it's definitely a um, 
I'd say best practice, right? So in the first instance, you can still get a lot of information by keeping that LCA as a separate piece to the initial scope three assessment. So you can do that first piece to understand, well, what are the five hotspots that I might wanna dig into? Um, and then once you understand that, then go into that LCA process. Yeah, thank you, Maisie. We've definitely seen it these demands in LCA analysis, knowing um, yeah, what power and what insight that can give you in terms of product and material analysis. So lots of questions coming through at the moment. Um, we'll try and get through them all. The next one down the list is around, is from Katie Montgomery. And she has observed that often suppliers cite geographical diversification in terms of we'll just get it from somewhere else or someone else as the only tool that they have planned for a climate resilience or extreme weather disruption. So question, I'll just open this to the panel. What do you think about this? Is this effective enough? And what are the other tools we can suggest or give suppliers? So this is around suppliers who are saying, um, in terms of geographical diversification, the only other option we have is to go somewhere else or offer a different product from somewhere else. But what, in terms of addressing climate resilience, but what are the other tools that are out there? So what are some of the other methods we can address climate resilience um, in the supply chain? Would anyone like to take that one? That is a curly one. Um, so I can give it a start, but basically, as, as you know, you're sort of getting at in terms of that question, Katie, there would be other options, um, but I guess the key thing is that they are considering it in the first instance. Um, so they have looked at what are the risks, where do they lie, um, and what is their solution. So ideally, they would actually have that backup plan in place, um, rather than just sort of citing geographical diversification. And I suppose this comes back into play where we're talking about transparency and collaboration and communication. So what's sitting behind that commitment or that statement? And do they actually know who that secondary supplier might be um, would be a really key question from my perspective. Thanks, Maisie. Did anyone else have anything else to add to that one? I think that just the key word there is collaboration as well. And like Maisie saying, you know, going back to the web supplier, asking you know, for evidence that they've really explored all options um, and maybe sharing with them, maybe there's a partnership there in terms of that product or service um, or supply chain that you know, can be some innovation around addressing climate resilience for that supplier. Mm. I might just, the, the, I need to wrap up what you just said, Nicole. Um, collaboration with business continuity plans with your suppliers is not something that I've seen really um, procurement do a great deal of, um, aside from the really big end of town. And we've seen that with COVID, um, the impacts. And I, I think that that's a really excellent um, opportunity for collaboration is actually sitting down and nutting out what is your disaster resilience and business continuity plan in your supply chain and how can you be proactive around um, climate uh, climate impacts and, and resilience in the future and do that together. Brilliant, thank you. And okay, we'll keep moving through so we can get through all the questions, but we do have a question uh, from Shamira and Shamira is asking, how can she find or reach out to choose a sustainability friendly supply chain? So she's currently working on an upcycling startup, but has had a hard time trying to find and reach out to supply chain to a working um, sustainably. So this is really starting from scratch. You know, how do you find those sustainable suppliers and those who are working for purpose in sustainability? Would anyone like to take that one? I'm happy to jump in um, to begin with. Um, I think that We've, we're seeing a lot of um, activity um, in local government. So I would, first of all, I would reach out to my local government council to find out who they're, who they're looking at or who they're working with um, and what the current um, capabilities are um, in the, the local area, um, because it is absolutely a key focus. Um, I think that would be a great place to start. 
The other thing you can consider, and it definitely depends on what type of supply chains you're looking at and who the companies might be in it, but is around those third-party verification schemes. So if you go onto the Science-Based Targets website or Climate Active, you're going to get a whole list of names of companies who have signed on to that, and you can filter by sector and things like that. So you can really try to target some that might already have made these commitments, um, and that's third-party verified, so you know that they are making steps in the right direction in terms of that. The other two places that you could also look um, is the Australian Supply Chain School um, and also um, UN Global Compact, because that obviously um, connects really nicely into the procurement and carbon piece. And, and collaborate with your peers. The, if, if the infrastructure isn't there or it's coming, the more of you that are asking for it, the better chance that it'll get um, implemented faster. So, um, and sharing ideas uh, allows everyone to um, have transparency as well as um, uh, get effective outcomes. So definitely reach out to your peers. Awesome, thank you everyone. Hopefully that was of help. Shamira, definitely just start having those conversations and keep having them. Next question is from Michael, and Michael is asking, what practical advice or examples do the panel have for using materiality to prioritise how to tackle scope three emissions? So how do we use the materiality process to tackle scope three emissions? Is this part of um, this process an organisation can take? I'm wondering if um, Asha Tanya on the topic of materiality might like to take this one. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Mick. <laughs> um, so I think there's there's a couple of things in the materiality process itself that I guess can be useful, and then we can we can chat about some examples. I think um, for for most organisations, um, you know, best practice around materiality means speaking to a broad range of your stakeholders, which would include. Um, suppliers and, and customers in that piece. So materiality can be used as a way to formally engage, collaborate, ask those questions, but also get that quantification that you might be needing. So, um, you know, it, it can enable you to get that quant and qual perspective on the importance of tackling scope three relative to your other uh, material topic. So I think it can definitely be useful for that if you're looking to demonstrate the, the strategic importance of it, both in terms of its impact to your business, what you can influence and the importance to your stakeholders, the three dimensions of, of materiality. I think there are a couple of challenges with mater the materiality process that are probably worth keeping in mind. I think for many organisations, if you look through any sustainability report and climate, climate action or climate change is one of the top material um, topics that are identified for many organisations, but very few actually get into the level of detail that is probably required um, moving into, I guess, this kind of next phase of phase of action. So we'd like to be seeing organisations setting really meaningful definitions around climate action that are relevant to them. Um, so that could be calling out scope three in particular, as opposed of, to kind of having this overarching category for, for climate change. So I think that's definitely one area for um, the materiality process to, to improve is around that kind of level of, um, uh, you know, I guess kind of that real link back into what it actually means for your organisation. In terms of um, companies that are, that are really thinking about this and are actually publishing work on this through their reporting and I guess their kind of broader communications, take a look at um, some of the big energy Companies take a look at Shell, take a look at BP. Um, unlikely examples, I know, but when it comes to materiality and taking action on, on scope three, these are questions that those guys are navigating on a daily basis. Also take a look at, um, at Maersk. So Maersk being a global shipping company, huge scope three um, impact. Um, and they're doing a lot of work on, on that from a materiality and, and action perspective. Um, Tan, did you want to add to that? No, just just, I, was, I was just <laughs> thinking there is a reason why you're the head of our um, leadership and communications team. I think that was a beautiful answer. <laughs> okay, we are coming to the end of time, but I would 
really like to just squeeze in this last question because I think it's a, a great one, which is around how do we shift that trend from offsetting into actually reducing carbon? So the inverted triangle that Maisie had, um, Maisie, would you like to wrap up with a, a response to this one? Is there a way we can try and shift this trend away from offsetting? Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to don't mean to harp on about these same themes, but collaboration and communication. So if you are working with suppliers, allowing them to understand what those differences might be in terms of a offsetting strategy versus an actual reduction strategy. And it is a hard one to communicate um, because you sort of have to understand what the, the basis is for those differences and why we look at this carbon management hierarchy. Um, but really that's why we have things like a science-based targets approach because it is focusing on those meaningful reductions. Um, and a lot of companies do couple a science-based target approach with offsetting. But what that means is that those offsets are reducing over time and at least we're getting those meaningful reductions to the extent that we need them to reduce that global warming temperature rise. Um, so really it comes back to communicating that what you're looking to see is a commitment in regards to actual meaningful reductions rather than solely basing on offsets. And as an organization, you can be pushing the lever in the right direction by choosing those products that are making those choices in terms of reductions rather than solely depending on offsets in the first instance. Thank you, beautifully said. Um, so that does unfortunately bring us to the end of our fantastic webinar. Thank you so much to the audience for sending through your questions. We had a really good range there. And enormous thanks to our beautiful panelists. That was a really big insight. Um, just you're all bringing such great areas of expertise from across that sustainability spectrum. So thanks to everybody at Edge and thank you, Jamie, for joining us from Supply Shift as well. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thanks Bye -bye. everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Have a great day.